welcome to the Speak and Flow podcast. I am so excited to be here today to introduce our amazing speaker expert, Marnie Hines. Marnie Hines is an executive leadership coach. She has so much experience, over 20 years of experience in technology, and she's worked at small little companies such as Salesforce, <laughs> Disney, <laughs> Sony, and so I have brought the best of the best, and I'm so glad you're here, Marnie. Can you share more about your expertise and some of your experience with the audience? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for having me. Uh, you already did a great job at, at introing me. So yeah, executive leadership coach, um, also an expert in enterprise software sales. So uh, not that long ago, I left Salesforce. It was back in October uh, of 2022, where I spent 12 years in enterprise sales space and uh, in a leadership role, as well as individual contributor roles, covering some of the companies that you mentioned, Disney, Sony, Gap, a uh, wide range of companies. And yeah, so I got my enterprise sales kind of chops uh, through Salesforce and the training there. And then prior to that, I have a whole other 10-year career in IT where um, like most recently leaving uh, Google, I was an IT leader there covering applications for the legal department, have some experience in big five consulting. And then also buried in all of that history, I also was in a PhD program in communication. Oh, so awesome. something that people don't always know about me, but in my twenties, I decided to venture out into academia um, and go explore that path. And so um, also have some training in that as well. Mm -hmm. And what lights you up about executive coaching what what is yeah what makes you passionate about it um I would say it's kind of funny because now that you bring it up in that way I would say my superpower my strength is deep listening skills oh. so I have the ability to listen and hear and understand beyond maybe the words that someone is saying it's actually the reason that I went into sales mm -hmm. so when I was in IT um at Google I was seeing like software vendors coming in and speaking but maybe not always they were more pitching than they were listening mm -hmm. and that didn't always land for me and I didn't always feel like oh we're on the same page solving the same problem and or they really understand where I'm coming from and so I said hi those deep listening skills how could I take them and turn that into something like in the sales profession as a differentiator for myself so it was the reason I went into sales I tend to get bored easily. So after 12 years in the sales profession, um, I was really itching to move one into leadership, but also coaching and mentorship and yeah. taking the deep listening skills into a space where I could really help people in a one-on-one -on -one capacity and potentially in like a group coaching capacity. So it's that, that natural strength or aptitude that I have to really hear beyond maybe what someone is saying on the surface that um, I wanted to kind of take to the next level into coaching. And we're so lucky to have this uh, opportunity to say because you have all this experience that you curated from these large organizations. And now today you're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about what you learned in sales and deep listening. And so what does make deep listening important? Like you said, there, there's moments where you felt like you were not heard. People were pitching. And um, but what you know, like go a little bit deeper about what makes this skill so important for people nowadays. Yeah, I would say nowadays, well, nowadays, especially with, you know, AI and so much emphasis on technology yeah. and rapid fire communication and more of like a transactional way of engaging with people, I feel like deep listening is now more important than ever, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, uh, a lot of big decisions are not simply based on factual information, but the place in which those decisions are made, it's in the limbic part of the brain. It's where emotion is stored, memories are stored. So we all think that we're making decisions based on these really logical, you know, practical sort of decision-making skills. And there's this emotional component that goes along with it. When you look at the communication perspective of it, about 7% of our communication is actually based on the content of what we say and 93% roughly, and I know there's different studies on this, so the numbers can vary, but a high percentage of our communication is actually based on nonverbal cues mm -hmm. that can include things like the pace of your voice, mm -hmm. the tone of your voice. It includes facial uh, you know, expressions. It could include hand gestures or the posture in which someone is standing or sitting. There's so much more that goes along in what someone is communicating um, in terms of if you are if you are the one communicating and then listening to someone else, really paying attention to what the other party is doing and how they're responding. And if you see a disconnect in the words that they are saying and maybe their body language or tone of voice, 
that's an indicator that maybe it's time to pause and really better understand where that person is coming from. Um, and whether it's in business or in, you know, in our personal interactions, uh, it's helpful to really get on the same page with the other person to get to a desired outcome that's mutually agreeable for both parties. Oh, yeah. I hear a lot of people getting the training that they need to listen deeply, to look for those language cues, to stop if you're seeing someone withdraw. At the same time, I think it's really difficult for people to do that. Uh, they, it's like they know to do it, but then they don't know how or they don't they don't end up doing it. What is the Yeah. Yeah, I've noticed the same. So for a lot of people, what I would say is that um, the way in which uh, we our natural tendency is to process information is based on our own personal mental map. So you might hear a word or phrase mentioned and what you're naturally going to do, it all happens at the subconscious level, is your brain's going to process that phrase based on your own personal understanding of that term. Mm -hmm. So I can even give an example for myself recently I had a woman sharing with me, she was having challenges with some um, job interviews and or landing in an executive sales role at larger enterprise companies and she kept using the term matrix organization and I was like, I finally had to tell her every time you say this term matrix organization, I go backwards in time to my PhD days when I actually did like a presentation on the topic of matrix organization. So when you say that word, the way I interpret it is PhD academia 20 years ago, communica organizational communication, but I know that's not what you intend. Mm -hmm. So it's this way we naturally interpret things ourselves based on how we understand and make sense of the world. And the reality is for someone else, that meaning making happens in possibly a completely different way. So it's important to check in with others to say, hey, what I'm hearing is this. I know you're saying this. Can you share what you mean by that? And it could be a lot even simpler than that. But when you start to notice a little bit of dissonance going on with yourself and trying to understand, or you hear something, you go, wow, that's, I could interpret that two to three different ways. And you're not sure which one, just pause and say, hey, can you share more about what you mean by X, Y, and Z? Mm hmm. And so what do you think are the components of deep listening? Because I hear that you're saying it's being aware of ourselves when we're mm -hmm. listening. What are the cues that we're getting? Are we listening for a certain um, how do we interpret the meaning if it's a clear, if it's not? And so if it's not, then then ask, mm -hmm. paraphrase, mirror or say it back to the person to ensure you are listening deeply. And mm -hmm. and so what are those key components that you think are you know, pertinent to deep listening? Yeah, there, I would say there's at least a couple. So one would be if a person is saying one thing and then the facial expressions or gestures or tone of voice indicate a different communication or message, mm -hmm. that's an indicator that it's important to pause and check in um, or evaluate if your understanding is accurate and where they're really coming from. I found this highly useful actually in the role that I was in, in sales and enterprise sales. When you're in a tough negotiation, the other party, if you're like, hey, offering up all these different deal structures, trying to a little bit guess at what are the levers that are most important to them, knowing they're not going to probably lay out all the cards for you up front, you might say, hey, we're willing to give you instead of like a, you know, a five-year term, a three-year term, if you get like almost a zero reaction from them or kind of like they'll say yeah sure that's great or no I don't care like they no matter what they say if the tone is kind of low or they kind of move on to the next topic it's not the thing that's most important to them so you now have that information that you can make use of going forward so there's going to be a dissonance or disconnect in a maybe a yes or no response but the like you might get a yes, but then what you're actually sensing is a no in either tone of voice or facial expressions. And that can occur with just about anything. Got and then it. another is your own internal barometer. I That's the one I use quite a bit for myself is if someone is sharing something and I notice the, that I am having trouble understanding what they're saying right. and I can come up with the two to three different interpretations that's an indicator for me that it's a moment to pause. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a combination of your own internal barometer of just pausing long enough to say, do I understand what this person is saying? And if you can come up with more than one response or scenario, mm -hmm. probably worth checking in. Um, and then also checking in with the facial expressions, maybe not being congruent with what someone's saying. The final thing I might share is like what I what I would do as a solution engineer actually. 
I would actually like interview someone for 30 minutes on what were their requirements in 30 minutes time. You've possibly, if you're doing a good job at deep listening, built up enough rapport that in the last one third of the conversation, they're going to feel comfortable enough sharing with you some emotional balance of things that are important to them. Mm -hmm. And it might not be in the words they are saying, but their tone might like perk up. They might get really excited. They might be like, oh yeah, that, you know, like there's a, the, uh, the inflection of tone or voice can be an indicator that that's the pause moment to go back and check in and gather more information. So I think it's also just really being in tune with um, what someone's saying and how tone, pace of voice change at key moments in time. Mm -hmm. And then pausing and then noticing what's happening within ourselves and assessing the situation, what is happening with me, what is the best thing to say to help understand and get a better perspective of where they're at, because mm -hmm. what they're saying might not be congruent with what their reactions are mm -hmm. so it's kind of a dynamic between the external and the internal mm -hmm. for both parties and sometimes right. it's okay depending on the situation to I would say even name what you're experiencing yeah. or name what you're noticing so you might even tell another person hey I noticed that you perked up or that your your voice kind of like started to go up or you started to speak faster at this one moment can you share what's what's going on there or like you know, to share more about that experience and that giving the person the opportunity to share rather than you jumping to a conclusion about what's going on for the other person. Mm -hmm. is also a skill. Mm -hmm. What are the concerns that people have with calling out and seeing some of these things? Hey, I noticed you perked up or I noticed that you withdrew. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, I would say uh, it's so funny that you're mentioning it because I'm like, well, in the coach training I've gone through, you know, <laughs> I, when you get training as a coach, it just becomes more natural because yeah. you're going through repetitions of practice of naming on someone's behalf in service of them as well as the relationship. But I would say that that for people that aren't familiar with doing this skill or practicing this skill, it can feel quite vulnerable yeah. uh, to ask someone to share more in a moment that might feel sensitive or vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So, which I I would just call out and name that's actually a, a very normal experience to have and to get to a different place with that experience, it's practice. And then also being self-aware of, is that appropriate in that moment, given the context, if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, there might be more room for flexibility. If it's in a group meeting situation, maybe not. So being contextually aware of, you know, the level of appropriateness of, of where to drill in and where to hold back. Mm -hmm. How much of it are we bringing something, like you said, some experiences, the subconscious into mm -hmm. the moment? Because all, all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> quite a bit. Huh? Is it quite a bit? Is it a lot? Like, how much do you think is it? I, yeah, I would say. So I didn't mention this in my intro, but um, I also have um, a master certification in neuro linguistic programming, which is the study of what's happening at the subconscious level in terms of meaning making. Right. We are always doing our meaning making at the subconscious level. Like, we, it's not something that we can almost help or change it just is naturally happening so that could be beliefs sensory level experiences memories it's all kind of right. the filter through which we make sense of the world right. uh, and so that's where the pausing actually becomes yeah. important right and the pausing and also because when we're noticing the other person we're listening to the other person we're also bringing our own meaning into it mm -hmm. and and then, so that's why the pausing helps us to differentiate between, is it me? Is it my own judgment, my own evaluation, what I think about this, or is it, am I really listening to the other person? Mm -hmm. right? Am I really? Yeah, you even brought up another uh, consideration, which I didn't even necessarily name, but it's, there's also all of the like uh, cultural considerations, our background, yeah. our upbringing. And so that also is an additional layer on, um, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm doing like a training uh, or it's more of a volunteer program uh, through an organization called Calm Clarity. Um, and the woman who does that teaching, her name is uh, Zue. She comes from Vietnam. She shares that like from her upbringing of coming over from Vietnam, you know, for her parents, chicken feet are like the best thing ever. Well, <laughs> and 
<laughs> you love chicken feet. I love it. Hot sauce and soy sauce with the chicken feet. No. And I'm like, as soon as I hear chicken feet, I am like, absolutely not. Same. And she has the same reaction, but it's just a, a variation and experience for the same exact thing that we have. And that also comes from like a cultural upbringing. Uh, oh, upbringing as well. I, can, I can imagine going into imagine for me going into a situation, maybe a masculine leader and I'm a feminine. I brought it been brought up with uh, being the women being more submissive. And mm-hmm. so how much of that is my cultural upbringing that I already go into the situation just listening and not really wanting to say too much. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. That, that gets factored in as well as part of our social norms. Um, yeah, I do uh, some facilitation for a program called I am remarkable and that comes up a fair amount. So there's also considerations around gender. What are the social norms and or upbringings that we come from that tend towards women potentially not speaking up as much or being a bit more passive or more moving in the directive of direction of active listening, but maybe not speaking up when it's an appropriate moment for our voices to be heard of knowing those signals and cues. Yeah. So what do you recommend for, I mean, because this is so ingrained in us. This is subconscious. It's cultural. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're we're not going to (laughs) win. Forget it. (laughs) What what do you recommend for someone if it's so deep, such as obviously work with you, right? That would be (laughs) something else that you could recommend Mm -hmm. for us. Yeah, I would say there's at least a couple of things. I'm really big on intention setting. So I always believe that the first starting point from which to have a new and or different experience or develop a particular behavior is to have the intention to develop that skill and or change that behavior. So if you want to develop in the deep listening area and or um, kind of overcome some of those social norms that we were just talking about, let's say hypothetically you're going into a meeting at work and So you could always set the intention to say, in this meeting, I'm going to practice two skills, active listening and speaking up at an, you know, at a moment in time where it makes sense for my voice to be heard. And I'll do that at least two times, or, you know, you can set an intention for yourself before you go into an interaction. And then there's also the practicing something that's not natural for you. Mm -hmm. And so there are ways that you can get into the repetition of, I mean, it could be as simple as what I just described. Hey, in the active listening of like a one-on-one that you're doing with someone, whether you're a leader or you're an individual contributor with a, you know, with, with a leader, I'm going to practice active, active listening in this particular one-on-one. And what that means for me is, you know, anytime I don't understand what the other person's saying, I'm going to pause and ask for clarification. So if you walk into a meeting or interaction, setting the intention You could even then, sometimes our brains can process information better or learn more if we write things down actually physically. So you could even leave the meeting, giving yourself five minutes to write down the things that you noticed um, that were maybe in from a deep listening standpoint, dissonant or from what the person said versus the facial expression. So you start to get into the habit and build the skill and the muscle. Mm -hmm. Starting to be more aware, having the intention to, to do it. And then starting to be more aware of exactly where you're at and have you done it or have you not and supporting yourself with Mm -hmm. to making a habit. Yeah. You could also know that as I'm sharing now too, I mean, in a work context, obviously everything is, there's an interpersonal dynamic to it and, or even in a group context, it's the, the meaning making isn't just by you alone. There's always another party involved. Um, whether and then the outcome being decision making or you know behavior or w- wide range of things, so asking others for feedback if this is something that you're intentionally working on, whether that's a leader, your peers, etc. Say you know, hey, this is something I'm going to work on over the next week or two. I would love to get your feedback if you notice any changes between now and this time when I'm personally um, you know planning to work on this. Mm-hmm. What about those leaders that? <laughs> I want to say they they're they're there they're with the people and there's a they ask for the feedback and then they listen but they really don't listen or they want to move on Mm -hmm. because we're we're in this world where we do want to listen but we also have a lot of things to get done Mm -hmm. so what about what are some strategies for those leaders that I I think they have this they want to strike that balance I don't know if they really want to but because they have all these other things going on yeah, it's a, I would say it's an, there's an art to it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the most simple thing that I've noticed is the, the practice of naming. 
Uh -huh. um, so let's say, you know, like something comes up in a team meeting uh, in the last, it's a 30 minute team meeting. The last five minutes is when right. the really juicy stuff comes up from some team member. <laughs> I completely <laughs> like, oh, yeah. so now we're out of time. Now we're here. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, those things happen. So you name it, um, acknowledge it, notice it, and then also share. And given that we don't have much time left remaining, you know, here's the focus for what we accomplished today. I do want to make sure we cover this topic. And then as a leader, you could choose to cover it, you know, for a bit of time in a one-on-one -on -one -on -one or multiple one-on-ones or is dedicating a portion of the next meeting to that topic. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important if something's important enough to others, and that's the deep listening part is kind of tuning into how important is that thing that just got brought up um, to name it, acknowledge it. And then you, and then you also, as a leader have to hold yourself accountable because people, that's important to build trust. Mm -hmm. So if you say you're going to acknowledge it and bring it up again later and address it again later, then um, following through with your action and your behaviors is important as well. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. I agree. What do you think are the key challenges uh, that people have with that as leaders? Of the na the naming and then bringing Just up keep listening in general. Yeah. Um. I'll be honest. I. Well, this is me coming from the sales profession. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're in the sales profession. They don't. It, it's not a lot of. There's not a lot of attention. This is very well known. Okay. On going from individual contributor into leader in that particular profession. Right. I when I decided to move into leadership at Salesforce, I interviewed about 16 leaders, and I asked them. I specifically hand selected people that had gone from individual contributor to then first or second line level leader. And I just said, hey, what were some of your biggest learnings? What do you now know that you would wish wish you had known then? The number one thing that people shared was to show empathy. Mm. So what they learned was they, they were kind of taking a command and control leadership style with their team, which wasn't resulting in the behavior and or performance that they were wanting to see. Mm. So they really had to develop a new skill set, which is really getting to know someone on a one-on-one -on -one level, they brought that up as now they've realized they have to get to know each individual uh, seller on an individual personal level, understand what their motivations are and adjust their leadership and management style to each individual person. Right. So what I would say the biggest challenge is, is that they don't actually get training in that. Right. <laughs> you're, right. you're put into a role to actually exhibit these other qualities and skills um, that are required. You got to a certain level, right? And then, yeah. So that, yeah. Right. And then so, yeah, so developing those skills, um, part of it is, you know, more training and or attention given to the interpersonal skills, the softer skills that are required to be a great leader, because being a great individual contributor, whether that's in sales or it could even be like in software engineering, you're really good at coding. Great. Guess what? To be a great leader, it's yeah. more than being really good at the technical skills. It's a different skill set. So putting attention on that in the movement, in the shift from individual contributor to leader, um, and then getting the practice, the accountability coaching can be helpful because behavior change actually takes time. Um, there's research that shows practicing a skill over and over again for about three weeks is enough time for it to start to become more ingrained at the subconscious level so you don't have to think about it anymore. So okay. it's that practice is so important. So there's hope for us. There is hope. <laughs> there is hope for us, even when it's a subconscious behavior. There is hope because we get if we're aware. If you're listening mm -hmm. to the podcast now that you're aware, you have the power to set, make a decision, set an intention. Whether this is something that you want to improve, something you want to dig deeper in. If you're not getting the results that you are getting from your team, then it could be because you don't you know maybe leaning in to deep listening, having more empathy with your team members, mm -hmm. uh, trying that out for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what do you think is the difference between empathy and deep listening? They're, they're it's so funny that you're bringing this up because I'm like, they're so interrelated. No, <laughs> uh, I actually uh, strongly believe like there's like empathy and trust are kind of almost like you want to show up with both empathy and uh, to then develop, if you show up with empathy, then you're naturally going to be having the intention to really want to understand the other person and step into their shoes. So you want to start with from the place of being curious about the other person coming from a place of empathy, which then can then spark the deep listening skills and make them more available to you as a leader, which then the next thing that happens is you develop trust and reciprocity. Mm -hmm. 
So it's kind of this, it's this cycle that kind of builds upon itself that then ends up resulting in higher performance. You become a stronger leader. You build a trusting team. Uh, retention is another thing that will end up likely happening. And or people might even want to work for you. You become the leader that people want to associate themselves with. Mm -hmm. And how do, if people are struggling, I know that a lot of people are struggling with deep listening or needing to up level as a leader, uh, an executive leader, how would they get in contact with you? Or what are some things that you have going on in your mm -hmm. practice? Yeah, so I, um, there's probably two ways. The easiest way to find me is just to go to LinkedIn. So just find me on LinkedIn, Marnie Hines. And at the top of my uh, LinkedIn profile, there's a way to actually schedule time with me. Oh. Um, so I'm happy to, to set up time and do like a 30 minute strategy session. Um, my website is also listed on my LinkedIn profile. And um, coming up within the next three to six months, I'll be probably putting more attention on like a focused coaching program for leaders, I still have it available now. I work with people for anywhere from three to six months at a time um, and even ongoing after that, um, should there be interest. Mm -hmm. And you, you've got Marnie here as a coach. I, I would be, I'd jump right at it because you've coached so many people in so many big companies and now you're available to the world. And, and I can sense, right, you're deep listening for others and you're deep empathy for others. And that's how you see people and that's how you help them to rise. And so- we're so lucky to have you out here and thank you thank so you for much for sharing me. these this this nugget and the nuggets and the valuable information and before we um end the podcast i want to ask you one question that i ask everyone what is the key ingredient to unleashing our leadership voice oh that's something we we already talked about some of them uh, <laughs> yeah so, i would say yeah, um, empathy. I mean, I just brought it up as being the number one thing that was shared with me. Um, that then, you know, trust, I think, is also important. Um, and then being self aware. All of those are also qualities that are tied into the deep listening skills that we just talked about and result in high performance. Right. As, as a leader to elevate, these are the key ingredients because we were probably trained to do, 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 and to, to get the results and to probably not have as much time to listen to people and to develop that sense of empathy for others. It's uh, counterintuitive because well, time is of the essence. And so listening to others might seem like it's just not a good use of our time. But now that we're all of us here are elevating as leaders, we want to be able to cultivate these skills and we need to cultivate these skills to have empathy and trust and deep listening. And so I can see how all of those are key ingredients to unleashing our leadership voice and us as leaders. So thank you, Marnie. Thank you so much for being here. I really had a good time. And everyone, people reach out to Marnie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining the conversation today. Are you curious on how you measure up with your ability to speak and flow? Come grab my free self-assessment at https colon forward slash forward slash speakinflow.com forward slash assessment. And I'll see you on the other side.